Hello and good afternoon, ICF family. I'm here again on my favorite spot. If you don't know why, just ask somebody that has been at church last week. But this is my favorite preaching spot because of the background that I have. And I'm here again to continue the series in the book of Ephesians. The title for today's message is The Secret Mystery of Christ, the secret mystery of Christ. And I want to tell you before we start that we all like a good mystery. Maybe some like it more than others, but that may be why Proverbs 25 too say, it is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search things out. And today we are going to feel as kings because we are going to search things out and we are going to unveil this mystery that God has for us. So today we are going to talk about mystery. I remember a couple of years ago and again, maybe the year before, we did a couple of mystery parties for our kids. It was really interesting as all the guests of the party, they needed to come in character. They needed to come in disguise. They needed to come as the character that they were assigned. And it was a mystery party because there was a murder and everybody was trying to solve the murder. Everybody was trying to see who was the killer. The party was a lot of fun. Both parties actually were a lot of fun. My wife and I planned them together and we had a lot of work planning those parties. But the great thing is that everyone is still talking about those big parties. It was a big milestone in our kids' uh, life and for their friends, you know, it was really good. Now, if you ask them today, who won the mystery? Who discovered the mystery? Who was the one that finally was able to guess who the killer was? They probably don't remember. Or if they do, they have to think for a moment. But what they all remember is that they had a lot of fun solving the mystery. So today, as we are going to unveil this mystery, the secret mystery of Christ, we are going to be in Ephesians 13, Ephesians 3, 1 through 13. And some versions call it the mystery of Christ. Some other versions like the Good News Bible, they call it the secret of Christ. But before we go into the message, let us pray, then read scripture, and then we'll start. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, I pray today that your Holy Spirit may lead us closer to you, that your Holy Spirit may help us unveil, reveal the mystery of Christ, the secret of Christ and your will, O oh God. Heavenly Father, we pray and we give permission to the Holy Spirit to move freely, to touch our hearts, to bring us closer to you this afternoon. And we thank you because we know you listen to our prayers and you talk to us through your word. And I pray that today you may talk to all of us through my words. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We pray in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So let's go to the Bible and let's read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. It reads like this. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, 
That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Verse eight, although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable reaches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Verse 12, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today we're going to see if we can, what can we know about this mystery and the mystery of the will of God. Today we're going to explore this passage of scripture and we're going to see that Paul tells us that this mystery was made known because God has a plan and he wants to give us this inside of the plan. So let's start with verse one. And this is my first division of the passage, just verse one. In verse one, we see that we already knew that Paul was writing this letter from prison, but now here the plot thickens. He reveals who has him imprisoned and why. <laughs> yes, Paul says he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is holding Paul a prisoner. And who is to blame? Well, Paul says in that verse, he says, for the sake of you Gentiles, meaning that Paul is saying in this first verse, he's saying, hey, you, Ephesian church, God has me in prison because of you. Ouch. That sounds a little harsh, put like that. But you see, Paul is continuing the argument that he's bringing us from chapter one, then chapter two, and then chapter three. It might be a running argument, or it might be, I don't know how you uh, English scholars call it, but it is a very long story that doesn't seem, seem to have a pause. And maybe it's like a preacher that never wants to end its sermon. Don't worry, that won't be me today. But Paul is saying, I am in prison because of you. Now, he's not saying this in a bad way, but he wants to call on the attention of the Ephesian church. And he wants to call the attention to his imprisonment because he is literally in jail, not because he did anything wrong, not because he stole from somebody or stole from the rich to give to the poor, you know, as nice as that may sound at some point in time, but no, he is in jail 
because he was preaching the gospel and they forbid him to. And he continued to preach the gospel against the opposition and some bad people just threw him in jail. And he tells the Ephesian church, I am a prisoner, not of you, not of the Roman empire, not of anybody else. He tells them, I am Jesus Christ prisoner. And then he says, it is because of you. It is because of you. So let's try to reveal this mystery that Paul is trying to tell us about in Ephesians chapter three, revealing the mystery. To reveal the mystery, we have to go to Ephesians chapter three, verses two through six. And here, Paul is going to reveal the mystery to us. He starts by saying, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation that I have already written to you briefly. So Paul is saying this mystery is no longer a mystery. You know, because I've written about it to you already. He says that in, he was able to gain access to this mystery by Jesus Christ himself. And the revealing of this mystery is really in verse six. So let's go to verse six and let's read it from two different versions of the Bible. Here you have it. The first one is the Good News Bible and the second one is the English Standard Version. It says the secret is, by, is that by means of the gospel, the Gentiles have a part with the Jews in God's blessing. They are members of the same body and share in the promise that God made through Jesus Christ. And the English Standard Version says the mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Jesus through the gospel. Meaning that for the Jews, this was a mystery. Why would God, after choosing people, will give the people another people to be partakers in that promise. And the fact of the matter is that the power of God is infinite. The promises of God are forever and ever. And it is like a hole. The more you dig, the bigger the hole gets. So the more you try to understand and to know about God, the bigger and the more uh, difficult to understand he is. So this riches in God, they are, they cannot be exhausted. They are infinite. So he decided because of his love to share with us Gentiles and with the Jews. This is the big mystery because from the beginning, God had chose the people of Israel. They were the chosen people. You read through the Old Testament and they were always the chosen people and God worked through them and in them. And Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our savior, he came through the lineage of the Jewish people. Now, in Paul's time, as a matter of fact, in Jesus' time, God had decided to reveal the mystery that he wanted all mankind, everyone to be partakers of his blessing. That means that the mystery of God, and I'm about to say it, the mystery, the secret of Jesus Christ is his grace. God wanted to pour his love and grace to us, to the Gentiles, 
to the undeserving, to the outcast, to the ones that were far away, to the ones that were on the other side of a wall. If you remember from last week, the, that famous wall of shame in Peru from uh, the poor people and the rich people or the wall in the temple that kept the Gentiles from the Jewish people, Jesus turned down the wall by his grace. So this is the secret. This is the mystery of Jesus Christ. He wanted everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for whosoever believed in him shall never perish but have eternal life. That is the mystery. And today we are partakers of that blessing because of this mystery. See, in the very words of Paul, in verse 5, he says, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets, which are the ones that brought us the Bible. So God's grace, grace to the undeserving, grace to the ones that were, as the Bible says in Romans, enemies of God. You see, when the apostles and the Jewish people were coming to Jesus for a miracle, and sometimes they came to Jesus asking for a miracle to a Roman centurion, they will say, oh, please do this miracle for him because he is good. He has built us a synagogue. He is nice to us. He let us worship God and he is a sympathizer of the things of God. And they were trying to convince Jesus to do this miracle for this undeserving Gentile. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus was the one that revealed the ministry, the, the mystery. Jesus was the one that tore down the wall. Jesus is the one that came so that we, the Gentiles, the ones that were enemies of God and went and at one point in time were far away from God. Now we are partakers of his blessing. Now that we have solved the mystery, let's continue and let's see what else can we get from this verse. Let's, oops, uh, one moment. Let's put the rest of the puzzle together, shall we? Paul explains God's will for him and for us. In verses 7 through 13, Paul gives, the Apostle Paul gives a testimonial of what God is doing in his life through him, and it also explains God's will for us. Let's get there, and in the next slide, you will see that Paul's testimony is in one color, and the other testimony, the one that is for us, is in another color, in a different color. Here it is, the Apostle Paul and us. Starting on verse seven, he says, I became a servant of the gospel by God's grace, given through the working of his power. Now here, I want to read first Paul's side, and then let's go to our side. He continues to say, in order to make plain the administration of the mystery, although I am the less than the least of all of God's people, this grace was given to me. So he's not putting himself out there. He's just lowering himself as much as he can because he knows, and you and I know, that if it was in our own merit, none of us will get anywhere near to God. So Paul continues to say, and to verse nine, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent is that now through the church, 
the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Let's pause there in verse 10. Paul is saying, I became a servant of the gospel by God's grace. Now, I'm talking to each one of you. At ICF, at International Christian Fellowship, Honduras, I'm talking to you. You, by God's grace, line. That's for you to fill in the, in the blank. But let me give you some clues. Maybe saved by grace, saved from your sins when you didn't deserve it. You can become a servant of God because God is calling you, even calling you today. Paul became a servant of the gospel by God's grace. We, by God's grace, we're here, we are the church, we are serving him, not just getting the things together on Sunday for church. We're serving him with our all life, with everything that we have. And Paul's purpose was to make plain the administration of this mystery. What in the world does that mean? To reveal the mystery of God's grace to others, especially to the Gentiles, to the underserving, to the ones that are on the other side of the wall, to the orphans, to the people that have nothing and they need God the most. You see, we, just as Paul, we are servants of God because he has called us by grace and he has done everything already for us. We just have to follow in his footsteps. And as Paul was to reveal the administration of the, minist of the mystery, we have been revealed that mystery. The mystery is that God's grace can reach out to everyone. And when I say everyone, is everyone. Because Paul is painting himself there as one of the most undeserving people. And he said, you see, as undeserving as I was, God chose me to bring the gospel to you. I can probably say the same. I'm just a normal human being. You may see as the pastor, I'm right now just the voice in the video out there in the church. But I am as undeserving as the least of those that you are serving in your mission, that you are trying to reach out to with the grace of God, with the love of God on Orphan Sunday. And then there's something that is really, really exciting in this. Is that God uses the church. Verse 10. That through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Wow, that sounds awesome, right? That the church may testify the manifold wisdom of God. But to whom? It says here, to the rulers, the authorities in the heavenly realms. Wow, that means International Christian Fellowship. We are called to be the church of God and to be an example. So the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms may see this is the true church of God. These people serve God with all their hearts, with everything they have. They want to reach out to the people that don't deserve because they understand the revealed will of God, the mystery of God's grace. So the church is called to testify, not just to the people that have never known about Jesus. Yes, we need to testify to them. But as we do, as we accomplish our mission to go and preach the gospel, go and make disciples, go and reach out and love people everywhere, 
we are also testifying in the heavenly places. But that's not all. There is more. Let's go to the next slide. You see, Paul was able to talk to God and he talked to God and approached him in confidence. And Paul asked the Ephesian church not to lose heart because in spite of all the prisons and all the things that had happened to him, he was left for that once and many other things. He said, God has called me and the kingdom of God is worth it. Now, church, let's be honest. We can pray to God. We can approach him in confidence. We have many verses, not only here in verses 11 and 10, but also in Hebrews, in Romans, it says that we can approach God in confidence because he is looking at us through Jesus Christ. And as we approach him in confidence, we can pray to him. We can pray to him. We can stand in the gap for other people. And we can continue to pray and be there, be God to the ones that need the most. Like the orphans and many people that because they don't know God, they are as bad as they can be, as bad as maybe you and I were before we got to follow God, get to know him and receive his grace. And lastly, do not lose heart. Paul asked the Ephesians not to lose heart. And Paul is asking you and me today, God is asking us through Paul not to lose heart. Maybe today you feel imprisoned by COVID-19, by the rules of the country you are in, by your job because you are in a dead end job and you cannot do more, or by the economy of the place in which you are, or by the circumstances, maybe some bad decisions that you have done in the past. But the will of God for all of us is to follow him, to give him glory, to honor him with our lives. And most of the time, let's be clear, you and I know what is the will of God. And most of the time, the reason we keep, at, we keep asking God for his will is because sometimes we don't like what he tells us. Like when he tells us, you have to wait. Not yet. Not that. I have something better for you. And we don't know what is that. But do not lose heart. If you are walking with God, according to his will, if you are doing your best to serve him and you are trying to serve him according to your giftedness, not everyone's a missionary, not everyone's a pastor, not everyone's a preacher, not everyone's a teacher, but everyone can encourage another person. Everyone can befriend another person and tell them about the wonderful promises of Jesus Christ. You see, we can do this. When we do it, we testify, not just as a church, for the community, for the place that we live in. We also testify that we are the church to the rulers in the heavenly places. So do not lose heart. God's kingdom is worth it. If you have to wait, do not lose heart. And maybe I'm saying this for me. Maybe I'm saying this for the whole church. But do not lose heart. Because even in the midst of the most unexpected circumstances, 
Remember, they are unexpected for us, but not for God. God knows everything and nothing takes him by surprise. So with this thought, let us pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we know your will. We know you want us to use our life, our giftedness to give you glory in everything that we do. In our relationships with our friends, in our relationships at work, even in our relationship with our spouse, with our children, we are to honor you and give you glory. We are to be graceful to one another and we need to follow you everywhere. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the message today. Thank you for revealing the mystery to us that your grace has made all of us partakers of your blessings in Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. May God bless you.